It is the sound of looking back, of youthful echoes remembered by the ears of wisdom, of alleyways walked by greatness where children used to play, and of autumn eyes reflecting on fleeting shadows from the past. It is a journey in the life of Dr. David Baker, an amazing man with a remarkable gift. I was shocked when I heard he was coming. I was like, really? He's a legend. A person like his caliber is coming to see us. Just a small drum ensemble. It's unbelievable. So what does a legend look like? A bright smile, an open, friendly manner. But behind the gentle exterior, there is a mind feverishly working, taking in every sight, every sound. Everything that I come into contact with has an influence on me. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for it to be synthesized, and other times I'm able to utilize it immediately. Sometimes I discard it. Man, you're a genius. No, <laughs> you're yeah, a you're... genius. Dr. David Baker has been commissioned by the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra to compose an original work. For its subject, he has chosen growing up in Indianapolis. For inspiration, he has come to Flanner House to share in the joy of musical discovery with Lawrence Grandpa Clark's Children of Rhythm. It's a day that takes him back in time. For strip away the adult veneer, he was once so very much like them. You know, I'm a country boy from Indianapolis from a time when it was a bunch of fields where the streets out where I live were still dirt, dirt streets. All of this is a part of who I am when I get ready to write a piece for Indianapolis. I could play for 25,000 people, but I could come here in the hands of a master. That's just as important, or perhaps more important, because it's home. This is David Baker as the world sees him. Pulitzer Prize and Grammy nominee, Emmy winner, to be honored in 2007 by the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts as a living jazz legend. A man comfortable with hearing his works performed before audiences of thousands. But the private David Baker will tell you that he takes greater joy in having his works performed before intimate audiences. He's composed over 2,000 works, and he knows that musical scores like Dancing Shadows have a very singular origin before an audience of one. A composer needs solitary time, the time to be able to write uninterrupted. Now, I put that on a piece of paper, I look at it on the side, I turn it so it makes a card to see if it's pregnant, if it's capable of bearing fruit. And you can tell pretty soon <laughs> if, if you're running, gonna run up against a wall very quickly with it, then you let that alone and try something else. To a, another melody. I keep a metronome on all the time when I'm writing because it's so easy when you have to break up the writing stent you write for two hours, and you're going to go do other things for four hours. Now, where was I with the time? And all of a sudden, you find that you made a disconnect. You've written something that's unplayable at the tempo you've been writing. And the one thing that's a common denominator to every composer... Nope, that doesn't work. ...is that none of the pencils have any erasers left. Probably your most valuable asset is that, is that eraser. You know, I look at Beethoven manuscripts, and you never saw so many scratches and erases, something that seems so effortless. I saw in the, the far side the, the, the melody, the ba 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 and it has ba 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 beep <laughs> and then it's ba 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 eh And finally, you look at the last time, and he says, Eureka. <laughs> it's only a fool that goes in a straight line when the road curves. And sometimes when I'm writing, the road curves, and I have to go with the muse. Most of the time I have to decide what is it capable of bearing. It has to touch me in some way, because if it doesn't touch me, how can I expect it to touch an audience? With an orchestra of Indian Happens caliber, the door is open. And it's up to you to find out how to tame the creative beast who wants to, wants to do something. The hall is filled with the sound of memories. 
not only those of Dr. Baker, but of one other, a man whose lifelong love of music inspired the commission of Dancing Shadows in his honor. My husband passed away about uh, two and a half years ago. His name was Brian Malloy, and uh, he was quite interested in many forms of music, including jazz, and this just seemed to me a, a unique opportunity to give something to Indianapolis, but also do it in memory of him. This is a rehearsal we, we have to bring out and to make the balance, and uh, it's a very technical thing, but behind, of course, my heart is beating. <laughs> I thought that the second movement is a bit hurried in places. Yeah. Okay. Like this place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Then you okay. can hear the accent. Can, can we do it again, the second movement? Sure. sure. Yeah. But you stay here, and you can interrupt immediately if okay. you... Yeah. Do, if somebody can... Bring a chair. No, I don't need a chair. Sorry. Second movement. <laughs> you said my knee. I just look old. <laughs> <laughs> I encounter a lot of conductors, and but I rarely encounter somebody who has a total vision and also the kind of sensitivities that Mario has. I've fallen in love <laughs> with Mario. <laughs> This piece tells about his life and about his world, about his mind, his soul, and it's a very deep piece. And of course I wanted to understand what he means and bring it out, and it was an absolute thrill for me. <laughs> he not only is a jazz composer and performer, but he is trained classically. He knows so much that he can put something down on paper that is kind of like a soundtrack for a film about memories of, I mean, happy childhood memories. And then suddenly you get to this part after that has all happened and we've gotten to this jazz section that is with all of us in the cellos and basses doing this plucked part, which is called pizzicato, and it's a very jazzy rhythm. You know, I've worked with a lot of orchestras and I've never seen that kind of empathy in an orchestra where there's so much love between conductor and orchestra and I just feel so privileged to be able to share in that kind of an experience. The, the piece went from his mind and his soul to paper, and now it comes back from paper <laughs> to life, and that I have the chance to go into this world. <laughs> this is an outstanding gift for me, and I only can say thank you. I know how it affected me and the fact that it's got some, a little bit of sadness in there, but there's an awful lot of joy. I'm just absolutely thrilled. I'm trying to keep from fainting right here now. It was very beautiful. I don't know that I have words to describe it. It was everything I heard in my head was on the stage tonight. Life goes on, even for a legend. Hey, brother, how are you? Just fine. No sooner has the applause for composer Dr. David Baker faded into memory then Professor Dr. David Baker takes his customary station before the next generation at the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music, ready to share the lessons that both music and life have taught him. And there's Thursday Night at Bears, where even a Grammy nominee can relish a little time spent with homespun musicians and the feel of jamming right in your own backyard. At one time, Dr. Baker dreamed of being a famous trombone player, but a serious accident robbed him of the chance and turned that boyhood dream into a memory as thin as a shadow and as untouchable as the wind. But then, fate had a wiser plan for Dr. Baker, for what was the trombone's loss was our gain. For it took him to a world of different silhouettes, those of teacher, mentor, friend, composer, and dancer with dreams. And that 
has made all the difference.